talking. Um, this afternoon, we have one last um, presentation from Meng Wang that I'll, I'll talk about in a second. And then after that, we are going to go into a pretty active working group. This morning, we had a discussion, but this afternoon, we actually have things we need to accomplish. And so we're going to talk together about ways to move this project forward. Today, we're going to talk about some specific um, principles and actions that we want to take. L late, late in the day, we're going to actually create working groups, and those working groups will work on Saturday morning. And we'll talk about how all of those things will happen. But as you listen, know that, you know, have your coffee, because we're going to put you to work in about an hour. I think we've got everybody, mostly. Um, I want to thank Ming Wong, who's a Codex Fellow, among other extraordinary things. He's going to talk to us a little bit about everybody who's sat in rooms like this before us and had these same conversations. OK. Am I up? Are we good? All right. So I hope that people online can hear us too. Do you want to check? Uh, OK, so I have about an hour to entertain you. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of the history of where, how we got to where we are today. Um, and I think there's about five generations worth of material to cover. Now, I have only spent a relatively short time researching the prior art. And I know that there are people in this room who have spent their entire careers doing the stuff. So I'm going to ask your forgiveness in advance. If I leave out anything super relevant, just let me know. And that'll go into the next edition of this presentation. So legal tech, right? This is the legal tech sort of landscape. And it is blowing up. And there are all kinds of entrepreneurs getting into the space. And the space that we've been talking about, computable contracts, is sort of on the bottom left here. And even in this domain, there are a whole bunch of new firms serving the market. And what I want to talk about over the next hour is sort of the history and the tradition behind where these startups came from. Bit of a history lesson. But before I talk about what I want to talk about, I want to talk about what I don't want to talk about. OK? And to do that, I have enlisted a couple of naked Greek men to help keep you Keep your eyes on the screen and keep you entertained. <laughs> I see Susan is looking a little worried. Uh, so can anyone tell me who these naked Greek men are? Who here has a classical education? Oh, oh, pictures off. Oh, oh no, I got censored. I got censored in real time. This is, this is my five second delay here. Oh my goodness. The, uh, this real-time like <laughs> penis recognition stuff is really good nowadays at Stanford. <laughs> so I'll tell you who they are, right? So one of them is Apollo, and the other one is Dionysus, or Dionysus, right? Depending on, on how you call it. And so you remember your Nietzsche, of course, right? You remember the Dionysian-Apollonian dichotomy, right? I see some heads <laughs> nodding. This is good. It's good to talk to a an, uh, an audience that's not just computer scientists, because computer scientists, they, they don't get this stuff at all. Um, so Apollo and Dionysus, right? Today, um, this is actually a really relevant dichotomy. Because in the old days, right, what does Dionysus stand for? Dionysus stands for emotion. Dionysus stands for sort of a case-by-case -case situation. It stands for realism. He stands for just reacting to each situation as it comes. Now, Apollo, on the other hand, represents formalism. He represents reason as opposed to emotion. And he represents a system of rules. And so we can see Dionysus sort of is the merrymaker. And then Apollo is the guy with the stick up his, right? Ah, good. We're up. OK. Got a moment. It's all right. I think we're good. I'll just. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, oh. If I need to, I can share the screen off my thing onto this thing because we don't have enough technology. Is that where you want to be? Almost there. Okay. Press escape. Uh, let's, let's use the Google Chrome if we can. Yeah. All right. Give me a minute and I'll get this set up again. OK, good. Here, I'll, I'll, I, can, I can poke it. Yeah, I'll try. So 
where were we? So here is where we are. So this is the, this is kind of what Dionysus represents. Let me full screen this thing. Yeah. Uh, hang on, let me, can I get this over there? Yeah, sorry, it's not. You see that little carrot right in the middle? Oh, yeah. Oh, that's oh, that thing, and there you go. that yeah. thing. No, 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 no. no. Other way, other way. Uh, yeah, sorry, I can't see very well from here. Okay, fantastic. So, this is what Dionysus represents. And this is what Apollo represents, right? And this dichotomy is relevant to us today because today we have fancy names for these things, but it's really these two old gods are still just sort of at the basis of the difference between statistical AI, machine learning, and symbolic AI. And in the last few years, right, Dionysus has had some pretty good success, right? Um, they're, they're really good with natural language translation. Translation has moved to machine learning and neural networks. But, you know, all that drinking must have affected Dionysus's eyesight, right? Because, <laughs> like, these are kind of the challenge problems that machine learning is facing. <laughs> And, and sometimes, like, like, sometimes Dionysus will do things that are just downright embarrassing, right? This is kind of the same category of problem, but it's a thing, right? It's, a, it's an issue. And so, so Apollo is just horrified at this, right? Because the way Dionysus thinks is basically, look, you know, how am I feeling about this? What worked well enough last time? We'll just use that again, right? And that's what we call a K-nearest neighbor algorithm. And the way Apollo thinks is he thinks, you know, we need to have actual rules and logic and things that make sense, not things like, not, not just doing things how you feel. And so I call Apollonian AI algorithms you can argue with. So that's the, um, that's kind of the landscape. Now there are a few things that Dionysian AI is good at despite being the sort of magical black box. So Dionysus can predict what judges will do that there's, this is actually two data sets. So the data set in the front is the prediction from the black box, and the data set in the back is what the judge actually did. And so you can see that there is one anomaly, and so is that a situation where the AI got it wrong, or maybe did the judge get it wrong? So that's an interesting question. Um, there's a company that went and commercialized some of these ideas, Lex Machina, I'm sure you're familiar with it, and they basically said, We've read all the law, we've read all the cases, and so if you want to come to us with your case, you want to win your case, we'll tell you exactly which judge you need to appear in front of. <laughs> so, and, and Dionysus is pretty good at handling big data, large volumes of text. Uh, I, keep a, I keep a list of startups that are relevant to the computable contract space, and last count there are about a dozen startups that know how to read contracts and say, this contract is missing this clause. So these are, these are just some of the things that Dionysus is good at. But I'm gonna stop talking about that because what I really care about is the Apollonian side. This is algorithms you can argue with. This is what rules and laws are about, right? If you have just emotional decision making, that's not law. Law is about rules and logical, rational decision making. So law belongs to Apollo. So five generations, I'm gonna start with zero because I'm a computer scientist. And the very early years of the, the PC era, like even before the PC era, people were doing computational law. Uh, this is 1960. So this is 1960 and already they have this vision that we've been working on ever since, basically, right? Uh, jumping around. Um, if you go further back, 300 years ago, Leibniz kind of had the same vision for a universal calculus, which you could use to reason. And it's interesting because we've got two quotes here. Young Leibniz from, nine, from 1679 said, you know, I think it'll take me about five years. And like every software engineer, five years later, he's like, well, you know, I think it might take longer than five years. <laughs> so. So this is very common to us, right? And so coming back to um, Apollo and Dionysus, in this picture, you can see Apollo is carrying his, his thing. It's called a it's, a, it's a lyre, or it's called a kithara. Kithara is the ancient Greek word for 
guitar, right? It's the same word. And the kithara is made out of the shell of a tortoise. And that is a, you know, like the ancient Greeks, they knew exactly how slow progress would be in AI. And that's why they picked the tortoise to represent that. <laughs> and so, you know, there's been a bunch of dead ends. Um, things don't always work the way you think. But 1957, already, they, Lehman Allen was thinking about how to apply symbolic logic to the drafting of legal documents. And this is exactly what we've been talking about today. Um, 1986, turning the British Nationality Act into prologue. This was a project done by Bob Kowalski and others. Uh, I found a really interesting book. Uh, it got remaindered, and I bought this on Amazon. This was published in 1979, and if you can make out some of what's in the contents here, you can see that they are thinking about exactly the same things that we've been talking about today. Everything from drafting and modeling and creation of, of contracts and creation of laws. Um, Thorne McCarthy is still active in this era. I ran into him at ICAIL in London earlier, and he did this very, very early project called Taxman where they turned the tax code into software, and arguably this is where TurboTax owes its origins. Um, here is another one, Legal, a the sort of the Algol or the Fortran for legal rules, modeling rules in the machine. So all this work was done in 1978. 1981, we come to uh, another expert system that tries to answer questions in a specific field of law called latent damage. And Richard Susskind was so transformed by his experience that he actually made a career of writing books and giving talks about how the law would never be the same again. And if you were here in 2014, he was a keynote speaker at Future Law. Um, 1979, the automated assembly of legal documents. This, this takes us right back. And this spawned a whole generation of software the document assembly industry or the document automation industry came out of this. And if you look in the 1980s and sort of the PC era, does everybody here remember mail merge? Yeah, so I think, I think it's fair to say that the ideas behind mail merge really informed a lot of the document assembly generation in legal. <coughs> Today we've got market leaders like Thomson Reuters has Contract Express, uh, there's Exari, there's hot docs. All of these things are sort of descendants from that particular tradition. Uh, A to J author in particular has been very successful helping people file their claims or their situation. I think they've run 3.5 million interviews and filed 2 million documents. So this is really powerful stuff. So that takes us to the second generation, right? Past the PC era, the internet era begins and we start to see more open approaches. People start asking questions like, where's the source forge? Where's the GitHub for laws and for contracts? And things like Docracy came around, uh, the world's only open collection of legal contracts and the best way to sign documents online. So people are trying the GitHub for contracts concept. Um, LegalZoom, of course, Rocket Lawyer, you know, they use this as sort of the foot in the door get the customers in and then start upselling them. Uh, contract standards, this is Kingsley Martin's thing, I think, uh, KM standards, KM. And then you start seeing completely open, free software, sort of GNU style approaches to document assembly. Common Accord was first announced in 2001, so this has been around for a long time. And recently, in the last three years, there have been new efforts kind of along the same lines, like Doc Assemble, and Doc Assemble is written in Python, uh, uses YAML, Markdown, right? These are new generation technologies. And this one helps create that guided interview process to fill in the blanks. So it's both a document assembly system and an expert system. Uh, Common form, I don't know if Kyle and Ansel are here today. This is uh, one of the most recent efforts that gives you a web interface. Uh, converts to PDF, converts to Word, and it's, it's kind of like a, a Ricardian contract. So that takes us to the third generation of 
where we are today. Smart contracts sort of got hijacked by the blockchain community. You know, it, it was possible to imagine smart cities, smart car, smart home, smart contracts, even without blockchain, right? You could have a smart contract. And to a certain extent, I think we've had to use the term computable contract instead of smart contract because these guys have hijacked smart contract. So the history of all that goes back to 1997. Nick Zabo wrote a very early paper on how to do smart computable contracts. I think this is the first thing that we would recognize as a computable contract. He wrote several papers about this. He proposed a very crude sort of pseudocode language. And you know, every few years, some work was done in this domain. So this uh, professor in Florida, I hope he's dry and safe, uh, wrote a formal language for electronic contracts. And so the idea of bringing formalization in really started to take off around the late 1990s all the way up to today. We've heard from Mark Flood about the automaton approach that we've seen. But in between 98 and 2015, there were all these efforts. Um, a lot of these came out of Europe, and I'll get, to, I'll get to that in a minute. There have been ideas for turning structured English, controlled natural languages, into a formal language. There have been ideas about taking the formal language and compiling English out of them. Um, this has been applied to contracts, it's been applied to laws. So all these ideas are out there. This is just one example of a contract specification language. This is the formal semantics for it. You could take this and you could turn it into a BNF and you could turn that into a compiler and you could have an actual programming language relatively quickly because all of the heavy lifting, all the math has been done. This is how you translate the math version into English. Right? And so the idea here is that if you take any contract, you could break it down into these atomic units of clauses. And these clauses are strung together through control flow statements into the full contract. And you can do this in the programming language. You can do this in a diagramming notation, which is also kind of a formal language. This was the formal diagram isomorphism for the for one of the languages called CL. And this is a basic coffee machine. But this describes all the possible states. And this lays on obligations and deadlines on top of those states. So this is, this, all of this work was done about 10 years ago. We're coming up to, to the present day now. Um, it's worth pointing out there have been visual notations in the past for how to represent these kinds of business states and business events. Some of us will remember UML, and UML then begat BPMN and things like DMN. There are whole XML standards around how to represent business process models. And all of that applies very, very closely to contracts. <coughs> Throughout the 90s, uh, 2000s, there was work sort of running in parallel. The semantic web people had all their ideas about how to formalize the web and how to add meaning and semantics. And there's all this work that's been put into ideas like XMLs and ontologies and models and metamodels. Huge amount of work. Um, as far as I know, none of this is super mainstream. And I think it's part of the effort today to take some of these technologies and productize them for mass use. So uh, it's very broad. Uh, ben Grossoff is here, and he will talk to you about knowledge representation and rule systems. This is a system called Flora, or Rule Log, and he's got a, a product called Ergo that, that does this stuff. You can, I hope you don't mind me showing this. No. Yeah? Okay. And so this is, this is how, you know, if you're familiar with Prolog, this is sort of a, a prologue on steroids, and this is how you write code in that language, how you express a rule. And those kinds of rules allow you to do this kind of reasoning. Regulation W says you can't do certain things if these two banks are affiliated in certain ways. And this reasoning tells you here is exactly how 
those banks are affiliated and why you can or cannot do certain things. So this gets to be very close to the kind of reasoning that a lawyer would do in their head for $1,000 an hour, only we're doing it in software. Right? So this is the sort of thing that should really worry lawyers. Uh, there's, there, I don't want to spend too much time on, on the semantic web side of things, but I, it is worth pointing out a lot of people have spent a lot of time building things like legal rule ML. And this is the sort of thing that we should think about sort of standing on the shoulders of, because a huge amount of work has gone into this. Legal rule ML wants to produce code that is readable both by humans and machines in exactly the way computable contracts try to be contracts that can be readable by humans and machines. And they've done things with RDF and meta rules and extensibility. They've thought through all of these issues. Uh, one example of an ontology, the word ontology comes up all the time. It's a polite way of saying that what I mean by a certain word is different from what you mean by a certain word. And so let's have an ontology to reconcile these differences. Um, this is on GitHub. This is, this is out there. And it, as far as I know, isn't being used very much. Might be wrong. A lot of this might be new to the American audience. Is this, is, is anybody like, has any of this been new to anybody here? Yes, yes, okay, good. So the reason that I would hazard it's new is because all of this, a lot of this research was happening in a place called Europe. So <laughs> Europe is, <laughs> it's outside of this country, it's sort of to the right and up. Um, <laughs> And they've been having conferences on, on AI and law for a very long time. This, is, this conference series has been going since the 80s. This conference series, they're in their 30th year on legal knowledge and information systems. Um, these guys had a whole workshop series on contract-oriented software. So it's worth you know, digging into some of the, the archives to see what they've done. There's been a huge amount of thinking. Um, now, down south, sort of down into the left, there's a place called Australia, right? Now, that's different from Austria. Austria's over there, and Australia's down there. <laughs> so in case President Trump is in the room, right, just like, just note that. Um, and so Guido Governatore has been working on all of this, regulation as a platform. And he's got an engine, and he's got the idea that you should be able to write laws in logic, you should be able to do regulation in code. And once you have it in code, you can then do all kinds of machine reasoning on it using this reasoner called Spindle Plus. So if you want to hear more about that, you can talk to him. Uh, lots of publications about reasoning. This is just like a fraction. You could keep scrolling down the page. There's, there's a lot of material here. Um, let's go to the year 2000. Um, some of the people who ended up producing Haskell wrote a paper on how to represent financial contracts. Now, for some reason, the paper was done sort of in Haskell, and then the actual company that was spun out, this ended up being done in OCaml. So for those of you keeping score, that's, a, that's kind of a tie. Um, but this is, this is exactly a financial contract written in a programming language that is computable, and people use it today for real, doing real money and real transactions. They sell to a lot of banks called Lexify, and the language is called MLFi. <coughs> so I have enough time to do a little bit of a case study, right? I've showed you what is out there. Now I'd like to show you what it can do, OK? And what it can do is here's one specific application domain called formal verification. If you're a computer scientist or an electrical engineer, you're probably familiar with this. If you're not, the motivation for formal verification first came about in 19, what year is that? 1994, it was uh, announced right here at Stanford. And this announcement about bruised integers turned out to be the first clue that there was a bug in the FDIV module of a certain processor that Intel had produced. Uh, this came to be known as the Pentium FDIV bug. And it eventually, by all, after it was all said and done, it cost Intel about $475 million to fix this bug. And it 
the FDIF bug ended up making it onto the list of the 10 most costly, the most costly software errors in history, right? And that motivated a lot of research into formal verification. Intel said, how do we make sure that we never spend another $475 million on fixing our hardware bugs ever again? And that led to the sort of the growth of the formal verification, formal methods industry. Things like model checking came around, LTL, CTL. These are all techniques used to make sure that your chips are bug free. Now contracts are actually quite similar to hardware in that sense because you write your contract, you sign that contract and you don't get to fix that contract ever again, right? It's not like we can recall the contract and say, well, we, we need to do a patch on this thing because there's a bug in there and we don't want you to take advantage of this bug, so we're just gonna fix that bug, right? You, you generally don't get to do that. And so contracts and hardware have a lot in common and the techniques that we use for hardware can be applied to to contracts. And here's an example. Formal verification is a big field. There are, there's a specific language or a logic that you can use called LTL or CTL, linear temporal logic, computation tree logic. And all of this is relevant to contracts because there's this guy called Ken Adams and he wrote the book on how to write contracts. And the other day, he put out a tweet and he asked, He's probably writing his chapter here, and he, he asked, how do I distinguish these two cases? Number one, Acme shall do this thing forever and always, right? And number two, Acme shall pay the purchase price at some point, but obviously you only pay it once, right? But in a contract, in, in natural language, you just say, I shall do this, I shall do that, right? You don't distinguish between the senses of shall and so he's saying, linguists, how do, I, how do I distinguish these two verbs? Now, I submit that he's asking the wrong people. You should be asking the people over in Gates, because uh, we've got logic. We've got the tools we need to answer this question, and I will bore you for the next five minutes with the details and the minutia of exactly how CTL works to answer his question. Are you guys ready for this? Okay? Okay. So, Here's the future, right? That top circle is the present state, and those arrows lead to future states, and you can say, here's where we are, and here's the next thing that's gonna happen. You can say, this thing is going to happen in the next future, or this thing is going to be true in every future. This thing is going to happen in at least one future, but it's always going to be true all the way through that future, or this thing is going to be true at some point in every future. So I'm not gonna go through all the possibilities. I'm just going to point out that this gives you a precise mathematical language for describing the future. Now Guido disagrees, but why don't we get to that in the, I'm just trying to motivate here. Um, but this gives you a reasonably accurate language for the kinds of things that you encounter in contracts all the time, right? Contracts do try to anticipate the future and they do use language like this. This is the graphical representation and that gives us enough tools to answer his question mathematically, right? One of these represents the first case and one of these represents the second case. Which one is Acme shall keep the info confidential forever in every possible future? AG, right? And which one is Acme shall eventually pay the purchase price once in every possible future? Yeah. That's AF. That's right. So with this language, this is the kind of thing that a computable contract allows you to express. Now let's look at what happens once you have expressed it, right? You can start doing automated <laughs> bug finding. <laughs> and this is the kind of thing that lawyers get paid to do, right? This is legal reasoning. So you can model check your electronic contracts. Uh, this is some work that was done about 10 years ago in that Europe place that I mentioned earlier. And so what you do, don't, don't get into the details of this, just see what happens. We take an existing contract and we translate it line by line into sort of that mathematical notation that we just looked at. And once you've translated this, this into math, now it's truly computer readable, you can ask the computer to say, you know, like, 
where are my bugs? And the computer will tell you exactly where is the state transition that triggers the bug in the contract, right? And this is the kind of thing that you could imagine costing some company somewhere $475 million if you don't get it right, right? So there's your business case for this. So let's fast forward to 2008. All of this was sort of like chugging along in the background and then along came Satoshi Nakamoto and this just blew everybody's mind, right? <laughs> <laughs> And so for a little while, all the attention then just moved into smart contracts. And things like Ethereum came along, right? And very shortly after Ethereum came along, people started raising money for things like the DAO, right? And then when the DAO came along, Vitalik had to go be like, had to go think about this issue. <laughs> and this is, <laughs> yeah, and so this gets to a point, this gets to an important point in a minute because Today, you know, like Ethereum and all these smart contract blockchains, all these systems, they don't really offer a way for you to do a lawsuit, right? If you want to do a lawsuit, the only way for you to have a lawsuit is to have a full-blown constitutional crisis and do a hard fork on your chain, right? And that would be, that's just not very scalable. So that's what Solidity looks like. This, I think, is, you could claim that this sort of thing is the first real-world example of a widespread computable contract that's open and accessible to the public and not just sort of inside of a bank. Uh, Viper is another language that's trying to improve on Solidity. Tezos, they've got their own chain, they've got their own contract language, and they just raised 232 million. So, you know, what are we all doing here, right? Just <laughs> so that's, um, and, and, you know, that has the whole ICO generation, like these, these Cambridge kids, these undergrads, I think, they've got their little legal chatbot, and they're about to go issue their own cryptocurrency. So this, this madness, this is just absolute madness, and it's all Virgil's fault. Because <laughs> Virgil works for Ethereum. And it's all Ethereum's fault. So Mickelson is the language that Tezos is using for their smart contracts. This is another example, and this is stack-based. And so I predict that every major paradigm of programming language design is eventually going to find its, its analog in contract programming languages. You've got like imperative JavaScript style, and that's Solidity. You've got a stack-based fourth style program, and that's Mickelson, and eventually we're gonna see logic program-based smart contract languages, and that'll be like the prologue of, of smart contracts and computable contracts. So all these paradigms, I think, cross over. There's a couple other things. These guys are also working on their smart contract language and their own private blockchain. Uh, Adjoint are about to make a major announcement about their smart contract language. And so the fact that people are thinking about real world adoption of blockchain smart contracts in the context of existing legal systems, you're sort of like thinking about how do I hook up the legal system to the smart contract world? And you end up with these hybrids, which are sort of like, I'm a helicopter and a plane, right? So people have been thinking about this. Uh, a lot of activity in July this year uh, R3 has been thinking about how to have master agreements for blockchain smart contracts, basically. Um, there have been a number of initiatives announced. Open Law wants to build a bridge. Uh, these guys, Ether Party, they want to build a bridge. Agrello, they just did their ICO, they want to build a bridge. Uh, the Materium people, they want to build a bridge. Uh, the, uh, the novel element with Materium, by the way, is that uh, you know, up until now we've looked at mostly financial computable contracts that banks can use for things like ISDA. And we've heard the challenge, why don't we open it up to more than just financial, why don't we open it up to arbitrary goods and services. People want to be able to create arbitrary contracts, whether it's like a lease agreement, rental, buy, sale, you know, I'm gonna put some goods on a ship so when you have arbitrary types of contracts, you're gonna have more kinds of disputes to deal with. There's gonna be dispute resolution that you have to worry about. And then that takes you to arbitration. And the novel element in Materium is that 
they say, why don't we, you know, like the whole blockchain thing allows us to bypass state currencies. So why don't we also find a way to bypass state courts, right? So their idea is to assemble a council of arbitration experts, a council of, of dispute resolution experts who know about smart contracts and know about blockchain and if you have a dispute arising out of your smart contract transaction, instead of going to court in your country, you go to this council who are prepared and experienced in that domain. So, you know, it's like, let's bypass state currencies, let's bypass state courts. So that's an interesting idea. Uh, Koala also wants to bridge uh, smart contracts with the legal world. The Accord project wants to bridge the smart contract with the legal world. Um, they've got the International Association of Contract People on board. And I think somebody in the room might be involved in this project. Yes, no? Okay. So anyway, uh, coming back to Oliver's analogy earlier about how NASA originally wanted to build planes to get to the moon, right? I've showed you the whole history of like the planes, and now we want to talk about rockets. So the way I've framed this part is to say there are some specific open problems that I think we should start thinking about solving. And this is something we can think about later on this afternoon and tomorrow. The need for a protocol comes from companies like Apple wanting to do business with companies like Samsung. And obviously, they're going to have completely different sets of technologies in-house. How do we make it? How do we create this common language? How do we create a common standard or a common format? a common protocol for Apple to send Samsung a contract, right? This is an interop question. Uh, to generate natural language from the formalism, this is another challenge. And I just spent two weeks in Latvia trying to solve this problem at a summer school. It's a thousand words long. This sentence goes on for several pages. It goes down to like basement two, I think, if we, if we let it scroll. Um, you can read this and you can begin to appreciate the problems. Now, if you're German, this is no problem, right? But I think in, in English, this is a, it's a challenge. So here's another challenge. In 2006, there was a major lawsuit over a comma, and this was a million dollar lawsuit. They evidently didn't learn any lessons from this lawsuit because in 2017, this year, there was a $10 million lawsuit over the same comma, more or less. And just like speaking as a computer scientist, I look at this and I'm like, oh my god, right? You guys, we have so much to give you. <laughs> just like, <laughs> you know, it's like arrays, okay, arrays. <laughs> so the specific problem with that comma um, this was the comma in question. And the problem with this case is that with that comma, then you read these two clauses together. And without that comma, you read these two clauses together. Now, computer scientists, we have a, a term for this. We have a very specific phrase for this. We call it infix operator precedence binding. Right, and that's how we think of commas. Um, but you know, this is a thing that we could translate from computer science to legal, because legal doesn't really have solid standards about this. <laughs> to to resolve that lawsuit, um, they had to go to Ken Adams and commission a 69-page affidavit about commas. <laughs> you know, we've got something called BNF. <laughs> so Ken Adams says this has always been a mess. So you know, another challenge, we've gone through this case already, but this is one of the challenges. How do we use clear formalisms to deal with language like this? Uh, another obvious challenge is if we turn contracts into software, software has bugs, and so contracts will have bugs. We've talked about how formal verification can address some of these bugs, but we just need to make sure that we catch them all. So the Dow lost 50 million. Uh, recently, there was a parity bug that lost, I think, 30 million. 
that's not a bug in Ethereum, that was a bug in Parity, right? Okay, so that's fine. But it, people will think of these things and they'll associate the whole domain with. Um, and there's actually been a paper about all the different ways that you can attack smart contracts. So as we go forward with the development of computable contracts, we need to think about security right from the beginning, okay? Because thinking about security only after we've hit mass adoption is too late. So don't do that. Uh, this is some sort of background material on the form of verification. It is possible to use modern techniques <coughs> to build safer computable contracts through types, through model checking, through form verification, through language-based security. There's all kinds of techniques that, that we use in software. Um, here's a specific thing that I'd like to be able to do. Here's a, a compiler that says, I'm gonna compile with all the warnings, with extra warnings, to English and German, my program, my contract. And the compiler does the static analysis and tells you that you've got some problems with your program. You've got an unenforceable clause. You've got a regulatory violation. You've got incompatible obligations between one clause and another, right? This is the consistency goal that, that we want to achieve. Um, you could even say, you know, this contract operates in the context of all this other material, and the other material conflicts with your contract. And then it should dump it out into English and German and help you with the signatures. So this is the kind of thing that we should be able to do, I think. Okay, so this is a long list. Uh, I don't want to go through this right now, but there's a, there's a lot of work to do. It's, it's a huge interdisciplinary challenge. Different people will see different pieces of the elephant. And I think now is the right time to attack some of these problems because the research has been done, the PhDs have been written, the market is ready, and <laughs> we could do an ICO and like raise a lot of money. <laughs> so now's the time, right? Um, but yeah, so that's it. So I'll be at Codex for the next year working on this and I would love to, to see where it all goes. I'm very excited. Thank you. We have time for two to three questions that so we'll take a short break and we'll come back together. Okay, so what I like to do with questions is begin with somebody who is either female or non-binary. Are there any female or non-binary people who would like to ask a question or make a comment? <laughs> I'm doing my bit for uh, male-dominated gender environments here. Okay, yes, ma'am. Oh, you have a mic. In, in watching your presentation, a question came to mind. Um, I come from more manufacturing data interoperability. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the concepts, especially in the government, is this notion of technology transfer. So there are research efforts that are funded typically through NSF. Um, and a big emphasis on that is taking the, those, the technology that's developed in universities and actually proactively transferring it out into industry. Mm -hmm. In this domain, how does that happen? Yeah, so it's funny you should ask because I just wrote an entire proposal about this and my inspiration uh, is this book called Pasteur's Quadrant. Have you heard of this? It's a book by Donald Stokes. And the idea behind Pasteur's Quadrant is that there's different kinds of research. Um, here's the quadrant. Fundamental research seeks fundamental understanding, right? That's pure basic science. And sort of applied research is just aimed at considerations of use. And there's sort of this magic quadrant up in the top right, which is use-inspired basic research, where you're looking for fundamental understanding and you're looking for industry usability and commercial outcomes. And this is 
basically where Pasteur sits because Pasteur was given a job. He, was, he said, uh, people said to him, look, we need to hire you because our beer is going bad, our milk is going bad, our wine is going bad. We need to solve spoilage. And we've heard that you've got this crazy thing called germ theory. And so we want you to go like apply germ theory to figure out how to stop our beer from going bad because we care about drinking good beer. And so Pasteur said, well, I will, I will go do the research and I'll invent pasteurization. And so he fits into that quadrant. And so I feel like the work that we are doing should also fit into that quadrant. We should be doing fundamental advances in computer science and deontic logic and you know, these kinds of deep representations. That should be fundamental understanding. But we should also be looking to have industry impact. And that is considerations of use. So I think now is the time to do tech transfer out of academia into industry. The academia stuff has been done in Europe, and now it is time for America to just go and build some stuff with it. That's why I'm here. Uh, OK, why don't Guido, I think you had a hand up. I will go for male or non-binary. <laughs> OK, uh, thank you for the presentation. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I would like to, can you put the, the last slide? So I have a serious concern on one of your points in, uh, in the slide, in the last slide. The so last? I fully agree with you with uh, most you said. Are you talking about like the 13 things yes. I want to do? Yes, yeah. Okay, yeah, please, uh, I would be happy to. So essentially, uh, you said that yes, we need to have uh, tools and techniques to verify, let's say, contracts, computable contracts, and definitely we need, or in general, computer, computable law. My problem is with four. So I've proved that CTL cannot work for legal documents. So if we try to do with the CTL in the current format, okay. and with, let's say, in the immediate or naive representation, we're going to fail, simply okay. because it's not able and will produce errors. Okay. So please don't do it. Okay. Fantastic. Thank we you need feedback. validation techniques. We need to develop model checkers in this domain. But unfortunately, we cannot use off-shelf CTL or LTL model checkers because they have some problems. OK. Well, good. Oh, the issue is that they will report that some situations are compliant where they are not. And then essentially, after that, you cannot really determine essentially they are not sound. Cool, you've just saved us five years. So it, it was so all, it, yeah. <laughs> I've published the results back in 2015. Right, well, yeah, yeah. We, we've been having this discussion. So I'm glad that's, this is from a, you know, this is from some time ago. Is there a female or non-binary person who would like to ask a question or say anything? All right, you get to be non-binary. What, what <laughs> go ahead. Uh, previous slide. The green one, yeah. Is this? Uh, this is this, from the future. Does this exist now, or is this uh, aspirational? I, I, this is out of my time machine. Uh, <laughs> Sorry. Way forward machine. But we will build this. Is this something that people want? Yeah. Like, should we do this? Good. Okay. Let's do this. Um, all right. I'm giving up on the whole gender thing. So just like raise your hand. Hey, I thought that I thought that was a great presentation. I guess one thinking about the the rocket ships uh -huh. part. The, I guess one thing that that wasn't there. I'm just kind of curious what your thoughts are. Uh, particularly thinking about more dynamic contracts was outside data feeds or oracles or or those those types of arrangements. I think that's where it begins to diverge when you begin to think about how you can actually input data in. So I don't know what your thoughts are. Or yeah, some of the so challenges related to that. That's a like the question of so. I'll kind of repeat the question as I would like to have heard it. Um, what do we do about basically runtime human input? So you need oracles, what, what the blockchain people call oracles. Sometimes there's ambiguity in a contract. How do you deal with ambiguity? Do you get it resolved by a judge, right? That's called litigation. Or do you get it resolved sort of by some other non-judge oracle? So these are all good questions. And the Nobel Prize for Economics last year was won by answering exactly that question. So all we have to do is go read that body of work, and we'll have our answer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is the Bengta Holstrom. Yes? 
Okay, the mic is coming. Just when Mark. you didn't ask for a female, you got one. Um, so I was wondering how much you um, have, have read or looked into looking at other systems for ideas. Um, and, and the system I'm looking at it right now is synthetic biology. Um, I, it seems Rebecca and I were talking briefly about how to make the protocols broad enough to encompass potentially more than just contracts. And it seems to me synthetic biology is an interesting place to look at this time, because they've been going through, I think, much of this same problem. Synthetic biology, okay, well, uh, yeah. This is basically an in silico problem, right? And if you can do like molecular biology in silico, then the sort of computational biology that works over there should work over here. Computational law is law in silico. Um, I'm sure there are things that can be done on both sides. You could do things like simulation. Um, you, could, you could say, what happens if we run this experiment a thousand times? You could say, what happens if we run this contract a thousand times? Or what happens if we run this law a thousand times? You could start modeling political economy at incredibly fine grain by saying, we're going to change this law in this way, and that is now amenable to being pushed through the SimCity version of our country, right? And so all of that, like you could say tax incentives or, or different kinds of penalties or different structuring issues, all of that can be modeled in new ways. So I think that's a really good insight. I don't know how this applies to synthetic biology, though. Okay. We have a male question here, yeah, and then I'm, the female I'm, question. I'm very sorry for that. All right. Um, uh, you, you triggered my question with, uh, with the Nobel Prize, I'm sorry. So you were probably referring to Oliver Hart, but Helmstern also got it together with, and, and he said actually something astonishing, maybe we can follow up on this afterwards. He said that in some market situation, and in some kind of markets, you prefer to not have uh, a transparent logical contract, you, you actually prefer uh, uncertainty because you can create consensus better in, a, in an uncertain environment in some situations than yeah. if you have all this detail. I'm, I, have, I have doubts about this, I, I, but this is why I would like to discuss it. Uh, but he made this, he, made, he published this in a paper, in a BIS paper last year. Uh -huh. And the second thing is the, the question, um, if, if you have, um, uh, you, you only mentioned in your discussion now chaotic logic, so it's a bit related to that. If I have, dyna if I have dynamical systems, uh, which many contracts will be over time, uh, or, or, or game theory uh, uh, that is a bit more complicated than a two-person uh, uh, two one-shot game, at, at some point I only care, I have so many solutions, possible solutions that are all correct mathematically. They are lo logically all correct, and I have no way to choose amongst them. At some, at, some, at some stage, I only switch to monitoring if certain qualitative properties of my system are preserved over time. Uh, do you have any com comment on this? Is that what you were referring to with chaotic logic, that yeah, we could partly. also restrict ourselves to pre preservation of certain qualitative properties? Of a, of, of a contract while not trying to pinpoint exactly what it will look like in, in, in period uh, right. 5,300 from now. Talking. I'll close that. So, that's, so that is one interesting avenue of exploration, right? Like once you've got these things fully formalized, you could start modeling them and, and experimenting with them. You might be able to do some sort of like genetic algorithm tweaking of the contract itself. Um, but that's one direction. But let me, let me offer a different direction that you could go into, which is also very interesting, right? Because up until today, we have not had a GitHub for contracts. And what we do have is the idea of the contract of adhesion, where some big company says, take it or leave it. Now, if there were such a thing as GitHub for contracts, then you could start solving problems in contracts the way we solve problems in software, which is to say, I'm not going to pay for someone to write a bespoke solution, because that would cost $100,000. I'm going to go download something off the internet and use that library. And if I have a problem with that library, I will go submit a pull request. And so the contract really begins to take on the character of open source software. It gets modified by the community. You know, many eyes make bugs shallow. And you end up with something that's been sort of sculpted from every direction, from both 
you know, party A and from party B sort of pushing this boulder until they're happy with where it ends up. And that kind of feels like you've got what feels like European consumer protection legislation minus the legislation, right? You get there through purely market forces. So that could be a really interesting thing, right? Your contracts in GitHub will have like five star reviews. People will say, I've used this for 300 times with no problems, or I had a lawsuit over this and it was settled very well. You know, people will have those kinds of open sourcey web 2.0 kinds of transactions and interactions when we have GitHub for contracts. So that's, that's my thought on that, which is slightly different direction. Uh, yeah, wait, 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 we have a female or non-binary. Could we, could we bring it to the back there? Oh, you have them in a queue. Oh, okay, well, fine. You got to be female right now, Mark. I'll, I'll go non-binary, thanks. Mark, Mark's non-binary, all right, that's good. Um, uh, just uh, uh, um, uh, an observation on Bengt Holmstrom's uh, um, uh, theory. Um, the, the, the basic intuition there is that there are certain markets where uh, if you've got um, uh, uh, too much information available uh, that the participants in the market will um, sort of squander a lot of energy in an arms race uh, uh, fighting over uh, minutia um, when uh, th th there's no benefit. And, and the, the classic example uh, apparently is in diamond markets where there's a cartel that, uh, that sorts the diamonds into categories and you don't get to question the, the categorization. You, 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 you just uh, uh, bid over price. Um, uh, I think this is uh, uh, an interesting issue for financial contracts. One of the services that financial contracts provide is this discretization of uh, the space uh, in, into finite buckets uh, in, in, in which the, the world is supposed to obey. Uh, and uh, um, there's an interesting tension there. What's the, what's the optimal bucket size? Uh, because if you make the buckets too coarse, um, then uh, you end up mixing and matching things that really are fundamentally different in, in the same category uh, and, and you can get uh, uh, obtuse outcomes that way. If you make them too fine, then you, you get the, 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 the uh, sort of bickering over minutia. Um. Thank you for the comment. Uh, this article just came out recently, Did you need so your, it's you're in the fun. queue next. This is just a real quick comment for Ming. You're looking for an opportunity to start this contract GitHub, I know you are, and to follow it through to its natural, I would, I would recommend um, the Open Science Framework. It's an NSF project, and it allows forking of research, not just code. Open Science Framework, osf.io. Okay, well, I will go sign up for free. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, so uh, you alluded to uh, Oliver Hart and Ben Holmstrom's work. Um, I had the privilege of having Ben as a colleague and talking to Oliver about s some of that stuff. And there's a theory, essentially, of, of what is the basis for either elaborating or not elaborating a contract, as Mark was talking about. And so it's about risk. You can be decision theoretic. Um, you're talking about essentially the, the cost of going to a dispute versus the cost of actually trying to create an author and come to agreement on the contract. And so I, I think there's an important connection between the business value and this theory of when to stop elaborating the contract. Mm -hmm. I see one hand in the back. I'm going to double check and see if anybody online is not. Nobody's talking. Let's make to a us. comment on that, Ben, while the mic goes around. Um, in a world where it's a lot easier to edit your contract, if you get into a situation that was unanticipated, it's a lot easier for the parties to say, "Let's go back to the drawing board and edit this thing," because editing it is so cheap and easy. We can just say we're going to terminate the previous contract and renew a slightly different version of that contract for the future. And that could reduce a lot of the friction that leads to litigation. OK, comment, question. Yeah, just thought that there are some inputs that might help in resolving some challenges. Like, um, have you, um, uh, it, there recently the K framework group released a formal uh, semantics or formal verification um, work onto the Ethereum VM? Uh huh. Yeah, so that's an interesting paper. Um, 
And then after that, uh, so I'm curious if you are aware of this, and then I, s I have another threat to get into. Uh -huh. yep, um, I'm aware of this. All right, great. Uh, so then um, on the back then, when Nick Zabolf uh, first tabled the idea of smart contracts, um, there was also Mark Miller's work, and they had a, a pretty classical debate. I wonder if you have uh, gone into that research track. No, that I don't know anything about. Mark yeah, Miller? so. Um, so Nick Szabo, um, the uh, idea of smart contracts uh, as is implemented today in Bitcoin is one where, <laughs> I don't know if you find, Mark Miller, M-I-L-L-E-R. -L -L -E yeah, and um, uh, his, yeah, yeah. So, okay. so back then they had a debate on, um, for, for Nick Szabo, what he wanted to create is a, a public smart contract. Uh, uh, that is usable in things like transferable land rights and stuff like that. But what, ne uh, what Mark Miller was interested in is rather private smart contracts where, you know, um, two parties um, can choose uh, what uh, they want to ha uh, execute in a contract and that um, doesn't have to involve everyone else in the world. Um, so, and with that, um, Mark Miller uh, wrote a paper called Robust Composition. Um, and he also have this thing called capability-based financial instruments. Okay. Um, but yeah. All right. Well, thank you. I will go check it out. I appreciate the input. I'm All right. And glad this is learn. our last question before we go into our break. Okay. Um, could you pull up um, law.mit.edu? So I like the kind of hacky practical thread of this conversation about how do we do this in the open and share things. So if you click on collaboration on the upper right, um, so something that I've been doing the last couple of years that's been working, and I'll just throw it out there, partly because I would love access to your work and be able to share things back and forth, mm -hmm. is just sort of, oh, it should show up in a moment. I just basically have this um, funnel where when people want to collaborate different institutions or companies or governments or what have you, I show them this page. It sets expectations that whatever we do together is open source, creative commons. Few, basically, those are two big ones. And the other one that comes up is how to use the MIT name, the Stanford name, a little bit of trademark and attribution just to avoid that stuff. Not much, actually, once you agree that some stuff is in the open. The trick is, and this is the last hacky thing that I want you to see, if you go to mit.edu forward slash blockchain, there's one little button that makes all the difference. Donate. Um, and then click, this is um, with the uh, House uh, Appropriations Committee coming up with legal blockchains. If you go higher and do propose a definition of blockchain and law, top of the page on the left, propose a definition. Uh -huh, so that's nice. an intake form, a Google form. I do this in every, th almost every single thing I do now that isn't like an exclusive funder thing. You click the box and said, whatever I contribute on the form, you know, online, in a, in a workshop, in a, in a prototype group, at a hackathon, whatever, I license under Creative Commons. There's only one box you can check. It's not yes or no. So it's like, if, if you show up on the registration list, you must have clicked that box. I've got reasonable record keeping on it. And now everything downstream is easy. Yeah. Um, and recorded. And so in this way, you know, we try to hack the law just and push back the darkness one little bit. And the NSF thing is great, um, but it, it's a little bit cradle to grave. It's like they help with the entire project. It sort of assumes that you've got a bigger program and you're doing a partner-to-partner -partner kind of agreement. That's good for that. But for all of the little stuff where we collaborate in less formal ways, the, I found I've got a lot of mileage out of this, this sort of open innovation. And then we always put everything in GitHub as well, so we can fork it and get back to it later. So yeah, I hope that you guys do that kind of thing so we can collaborate. That's a very important point. Um, in, in the standards process generally, it's, it's very important to pay attention to IP and IP assignment because as multiple people representing multiple stakeholders make contributions, it's possible for the standards process to get derailed and torpedoed when one of those contributors says, well, you know, we actually own that chunk of it. So we need to make sure that that doesn't happen. Mary, do you have a comment about that?
that, that problem has recently emerged and has been recognized somewhat more formally in standards processes, particularly in the area of standards essential patents. Um, and you see this particularly in telecom, where a company will own a particular patent, and, um, but it's absolutely essential for the overall system to work. And then they have something about uh, the terms about reasonable royalties that go along with that. And um, one of the foremost thinkers in that area is Carl Shapiro, so, who wrote uh, Information Rules with Al Varian. So. Quick. Very quickly. Cause Very quickly. So um, that is why I invited the folks from TM Forum in the front of the room, John Wilms, um, Jean Glaudel. TM Forum um, represents about 900 different telcos from around the world, and so they have a ton of experience in this and a framework um, that's been in effect since the mid-1980s. So it's been road tested a bit, so if anyone's curious. I think that's a great place for us to take a break and come back together this afternoon because we're going to come back and talk a lot about all of these things. From the front of the room, I've watched them refresh the coffee. I've watched them put out cookies. So I encourage you to take advantage of both and fuel up so we can have a productive conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Meg. Thank you.